keep that open, please. Let's pray as we come to the Bible. Lord, thank you for that amazing reading, that amazing day of Pentecost. And as we uh, have a look at it now, think to what it means for us. And we pray that you appoint us and amaze us by Jesus and all he does. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine this. Um, you're standing there, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people in front of you. And they're looking at you. They're waiting for you to speak. And you might just have this one chance, this only chance, to change their lives forever. I wonder what you'd say. I wonder what you'd speak about. Or maybe let's put it this way. What is the one thing that people need to know before they die? Well, that's the position Peter is in on Pentecost in that reading. We just read, isn't it? Thousands gathered before him uh, because of this amazing thing that's happened at Pentecost with the Spirit coming and being able to hear the, the, the word of the Lord in their own languages. They're all gathered there looking out, looking at him. And what's the first word that comes out of his mouth after, after he's greeted them, after he's drawn them to attention? First words out of his mouth in verse 22. Jesus. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus. That is not what, but who they need to hear about. That's our first point. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Peter preaches Jesus. He thinks they need to hear about Jesus. In verse 22, we learn about his life. He's Jesus of Nazareth. That's where his family came from. But he wasn't just some normal man. We read that there were miracles. There were wonders, there were signs. And actually, some of the people listening to that sermon on that first Pentecost would have experienced some of those miracles. They'd have certainly heard of those miracles. It might have been Jesus healing a paralyzed man, or raising a girl from the dead, it might have been Jesus resisting temptation in the wilderness, or, or being transfigured in glory on the mountain, it might have been Jesus calming the storm, or Claiming to forgive sins. That's what we read in the Gospels. Through Jesus, God was at work. But despite that, what did they do to him? In verse 23. They handed him over to be crucified. He was handed over by, well, Judas. To the, Judas, to the Jewish leaders, and then to Herod, to, to Pilate, then to the Romans, and they're the wicked men who crucified Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, that's something that the Jewish leaders have actually been planning for a while, right from quite at the start of Jesus' ministry. And for them, it was done out of evil. It was done out of jealousy. It was done out, out of sin. But we also read something else at work. Have a look at verse 23 again. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Yes, he was handed over by evil men out of sin, but he was also handed over as part of God's greater plan, God's good plan. To, to save humanity and to exalt his son. This verse is actually a really good reminder to put aside, but, but you know when something's really horrible is happening to you and, and you're suffering because of someone else's sin or, or the evil of this world, and you think, what's going on? Well, this, this verse is a reminder that, that God can work through that to bring about good. Because he worked through the greatest evil ever those who would kill his son to bring about the greatest good ever. 
the salvation of all who believe. And we know that's true because of what happened in verse 24. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You might say Jesus couldn't stay dead. There's something a bit silly this week in the Bible story. I asked a question that I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> I'd written this question. And the question was, why was it impossible for death to keep hold of Jesus? And I hadn't done my research. And I looked a bit stupid. Thankfully, uh, John and Alex were there to help me. But we came up with some answers. Let a think. Bit of help of the internet. Jesus was perfect. He didn't deserve death. He was being punished for our sins. Not his own. That's one reason. Or well, the other reason was that Jesus alone could fully bear God's anger at sin until there's none left. And once he's borne the whole anger at sin, there's no more God's anger to, to take. There's no more death to take. And so he rises again. If you think of God's anger like a, a huge vat of wine, it's another way he says talks about it and if we were to take God's anger for our sin because we weren't trusting Jesus it would be a vat of wine that we drink forever we'd never get through it because of who Jesus is because he is eternal he's able to down the whole vat and finish it for the sake of all who trust him we also saw that God the father had promised to restore and raise God the Son. And so death couldn't hold Jesus. He rose again in glory as the Son of God. Peter's message, he, the message he wants everyone to hear before they die is Jesus, about his life, that he was sent by God, about his death, that he died to take our punishment, and about his resurrection, that he rose in glory as Lord. It's all about Jesus. Notice Peter doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit much, despite what's just happened. He talks about Jesus because the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. Notice Peter doesn't talk about himself. Notice Peter doesn't tell them how to be better people or how to live their best life now. He doesn't set out a, a three-stage plan for church growth. He tells them about Jesus. That is the message we all need to hear. That's the message he preaches. And I wonder if that's the message we're here to hear. Are we here to hear about Jesus? I asked my son, Ezra, this morning. I said, I said what's church about? And he said, Jesus. I said, yes. Good lad. Didn't even train you to do that. It's at the bottom of our, our slide, our church. That's seeking to know Christ Jesus better. And to make Christ better known. It's not the only thing we do. I hope we're a community, a family. I hope we want to obey God's commands out of love. I hope we want to do good to others. But at the center of all that, the message that drives us is Jesus and what he's done. That's what we need to keep hearing about. I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury saying, um, that in all his conversations, he always tries to mention Jesus. Now, it's probably a bit easier for him and for me to do that, isn't it? People sort of expect it. Um, but that's a good thing to think about, isn't it? So that Jesus is important. Peter's sermon is all about Jesus. That's the first thing we see. But the second thing we see is that it's always been about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. That's what he says next. So he quotes King David. Now, King David lived about a thousand years before Jesus. He was God's chosen king. He was pretty good. He made some big mistakes. Um, and he wrote a lot of the Psalms. So we read together early. One of the Psalms quoted in here. But before Peter quotes a Psalm that David wrote, Look how he introduces it in verse 25. Verse 25. David said about 
him. The him there is Jesus. He's the subject David said about Jesus. So David writes this psalm a thousand years before Jesus. And Peter says, David's writing this psalm about Jesus. <clears throat> what does he write in verse 27? You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy one see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, how do we know this is about Jesus and not about David? Well, what Peter says, well, because David did die. His body did see decay. His tomb's over there. He's dead. This isn't about him. Looking forward to Jesus coming, to one of David's great descendants, to someone whose tomb would not stay closed, to someone whose body would not see decay, to someone whose death would lead to life forever. The empty tomb proves that Jesus is alive. The fact that hundreds of people saw him risen. And so verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we're all witnesses of the fact they've seen him. It's always been about Jesus. Now, I'm not going to do this because I'm tight, but there's an illustration some uh, vicars sometimes use. They take their Bible and they uh, find the bit where the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we start with Matthew, isn't it? And they go, some people do this to the Bible. Shh! They tear the Bible in half. They say, and they chuck out the old bit. And they say, we don't need that bit. We only need the, the new bit. We only need the New Testament. The Old Testament God, nasty, horrible, judgmental. The New Testament God, loving, kind, forgiving. But actually, in his very first sermon about Jesus, Peter quotes the Old Testament. So we need the Old Testament. It's always been about Jesus. The Bible is one big story from start to finish, pointing us to Jesus. It's always been about him. Well, Jesus rose. What happened next in verse 33? He was exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So he's talking about Jesus' ascension into heaven. And from heaven, he pours his spirit on his people. And they just experience that Pentecost, don't they? <coughs> well, what does this all mean? Here's the punchline of Peter's sermon, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God the Son. Jesus rules. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is the King. Get it? Oh, and by the way, you tortured him and killed him before he rose again. I wonder how they feel about that. It'd be a bit like, imagine I was over in Morecambe for my day off on a Tuesday, and I came across a guy having dinner with his family. I didn't like the look of him. So I started giving him a bit of abuse and slapped him on the back of the head. And he stands up and he looks at me. And it's Tyson Fury. Now, I'd better do something pretty quickly to apologize. <laughs> but my wife is not going to recognize my face, is she, <laughs> anymore? Yeah? It's a bit like that. You just attacked and tried to kill the Lord of all. And he's back. He's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is King of God. I wonder how they'd feel. It says they're cut to the heart. They realize they're responsible. But here's a question to ponder. Are we responsible for Jesus' death? 
we weren't there on the day, were we? But could we face a similar accusation? He died to you. And now he's alive. Let me read um, this book. The Cross of Christ is an amazing book to read to understand what's going on at the cross. It's blooming hard work. Yeah? It's worth reading. Borrow it if you want. Uh, let me read uh, what John Stott writes. He's thinking about why did Christ die? And he says, more importantly still, we ourselves are all so guilty. If we were in their place, we would have done what they did. Indeed, we have done it. For whenever we turn away from Christ, we are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. We quote Hebrews 6, 6. We too sacrifice Jesus to our greed like Judas, to our envy like the priests, to our ambitions like Pilate. We may try to wash our hands of responsibility, but our attempt will be futile, for there is blood on our hands. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, leading to faith and worship, we have to see it as something done by us, leading to repentance. Indeed, only the man who is prepared to own his share in the guilt of the cross may claim his share in its grace. We sing sometimes that song, don't we? Uh, how deep the Father's love for us. We sing, behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Or in the uh, film, The Passion of the Christ, where you see a hand nailing the nail through Jesus' hand. Do you know whose hand that is? It's Mel Gibson's hand. He, he was involved, he's a, a devout Catholic, and he was involved in making the film. And he said, it, oh, it's because of me, I'm there. He's there. He was there. It was my hand that nailed him to that cross. God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so, how will we respond? It's about Jesus, it's always been about Jesus. You crucified him, he rose. How will we respond? Well, verse 37, have a look. When the people heard this, they were, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Repentance means to, to turn. To, to change direction, to turn away from sin, and to put your trust in Christ. It's impossible to be a Christian if you haven't repented, if you haven't turned to follow Jesus. And that's important to know because there's a lot of what people call Christianity or what you want to pass off as Christianity, but it's not Christianity because it's not involved repentance. So Peter doesn't say in verse 38, you know, what shall we do? He doesn't say, pull your socks up and have good morals. Be a bit, try a bit harder. But lots of people think being a Christian is just about having good morals and turning up to church and praying occasionally. That's about turning and following Jesus. Nor does Peter say, you're all right. You've got a good heart, really. I just want to affirm what you believe and do. Jesus will just make your life a bit better. And actually, that's what some churches teach. They don't teach repent and believe. They teach Jesus will just affirm whatever you want and make you happy. But that is a path to death. Peter says, no, repent, turn, turn from sin, follow Jesus. And so be baptized, turn and trust in Jesus. 
And, and baptism, I'm going to do a baptism later today, it is a sign of that decision. It's a seal of that decision. It, it symbolizes that washing from sin. When we repent, we're forgiven. When we trust, we're forgiven. It symbolizes that new life. My friend, one of my best mates, was baptized in the river. And you go under, as if you're dying. And you come back up as if you've got new life. When we turn and trust Jesus, we die to our old life, living a new life with him. That's why Christians should be baptized as a sign of what they believe. And look who this is on offer to in verse 39. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, to all whom the Lord our God will call. Parents, isn't that great? This is for our children. As we bring them up in the faith, that's why we baptize children here. This promise is for them. It's for, for everyone who can hear and trust Jesus. So, how will we respond to Jesus? Maybe we've not made that decision yet to respond with repentance. Maybe today is a good day. As Peter says in verse 40, with many other war words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And look what happens in verse 41, when Jesus is preached, when Jesus is the main act, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That must have been quite a sermon. Well, let's pray that as we share Jesus with others, they'd come to repent and be baptised as they know him too. Let's pray. Well, we can often be so obsessed with ourselves. Draw our gaze to Jesus, to who he is, to what he's done for us, and move our hearts to trust and follow him, to walk along the way of in Jesus' name, amen.